from when I got, because obviously I was remanded, so I've got arrested the Friday. They kept me in the local station over the weekend, gone court Monday, thinking I'm going to come out. It's like, now you're getting remanded, HMP Bullingdon. They put me in a sweat box. Okay, I'm looking out the window and I'm seeing the world go by. These times, alhamdulillah, I've got five kids. Uh, uh, so, alhamdulillah, I had four or five at that time, I can't remember. But anyway, I'm thinking about my kids. And again, I keep tears. I'm thinking, well, what have I done? How have I ended up sitting with scholars in Medina to now go into prison? Musa. Assalamu alaikum, Akhi. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Barakallah, Fiq, from coming all the way from Reading. We appreciate that. And um, quick one, obviously, when you, we originally spoke, you uh, you sent a video and the video showed about, I just caught a s- small snippet, but it went from being a Medina University student to prison. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we don't want to go straight from that to that, but tell us how you got to first to Medina University, because it's very hard to get into Medina University. And then maybe give us a route of how it went, maybe left. Okay. So in regards to Medina, um, alhamdulillah, I'm a revert Muslim. Inshallah. So alhamdulillah, I became Muslim when I was 18 years old. Okay. Um, firstly, growing up, I was brought up with a Christian mother from okay. Jamaican heritage. Mm. Uh, my father is German, but he was Jewish. Um, he converted to Judaism. Okay. But growing up, he wasn't around. Um, fortunately, he was an alcoholic. Mm. So around five, six years old, he disappeared off the scene completely. Um, I was originally born in Lewisham. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I got to year seven, I and my mother left London and we ended up moving to Sheffield. Okay. Um, stayed in Sheffield for like, the whole of secondary school. Um, but why Sheffield? So what happened, there was the unfortunate circumstance of Damilola Taylor. Yeah, that was away. in Peckham, wasn't it? Peckham. Yes. Um, my mum became quite worried about various situations that were happening across London mm-hmm. um, and thought it was best to move out of that area. But she didn't understand that the same things that was Sheffield, happening yeah. in London was also in Sheffield, yeah, yeah. you know, Manchester, Birmingham, everywhere, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, it was a completely different environment to London, but I became involved with... The Sheffield lot. The Sheffield lot. Okay. The area where we lived as well was very different to Lewisham. Mm. So it was a non-multicultural area, very lower class, white, English area. Mm. I compare it to, I don't know if you've seen the program, Shameless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. that that type <laughs> of setting. Yeah. Um, but the school that I went to yeah. was in the other side of Sheffield. Okay. And that school was taking in a lot of kids from the other side where they were more Asian and mm. black. I was around a lot of Somalis, Yemenis okay. growing up. So I had different sets of friends, you might say. Um, so yeah, throughout school, school was okay. Um, I had a lot of dawah from friends by going to their houses, by being around them, you know, seeing them pray mm. fast, etc. cetera. Um, and I used to go to church at the same time with my mother. Okay. Um, so she was practicing Christian. Yeah, okay. she was. She was practicing. It was a Methodist church that we used to attend. Um, but I always, in the back of my head, questioned certain things within the religion. So, in terms of when I became Muslim, um, when I got to. So this is around sixteen, seventeen. So I finished secondary school. I've uh, moved to. Yeah, I moved to Reading. So when I was eighteen, sorry. So your mum and you moved again to another place, Reading? Yeah, so what happened, things went a bit left in Sheffield. Um, I've got myself involved with the wrong people. Mm. So this is, like I said, from year seven, year eight. Um, And started getting involved with criminal activity. Um, In in hindsight now, when you look back, do you question why you got involved? Because again, I'm sure you've seen some of our interviewees that you can have brothers same age, different, maybe slightly. One is going on the right path, one goes on the wrong path. Like, did you think like now looking back, mm-hmm. ask yourself what made me f- 
follow the street boys or why didn't I just stick to my books and become a good but like do you question that? Of course that's a very good question so right now I currently work with young people um, and I understood the different variations of you know grooming mm. um, how you can enter in that type of life by being around the wrong people mm. before I got involved with working with young people I didn't class myself as someone who might have been groomed okay when I look back at various scenarios and situations that led up to me being on roads, then in a nutshell, it was grooming. basically grooming. When we say grooming, for those who don't understand, then how would you explain grooming? Okay, so those that might entice one by materialistic things. Um, for me, it started off as basics, money, trainers. So I had a very good friend in school. He had an older brother. I used to go to this good friend's house on a regular basis. Mm. The older brother was very well known on our estate where we lived. Mm. So I remember it. We was literally sat there playing FIFA. The older brothers come into the room. He's like, Moses, do you want to make a bit of money right now? I'm like, what, how much? It's like 50 pound cash. I was like, okay, cool. What do you want me to do? He's literally giving me a rucksack. He's like, go across into the park. You'll see a man on the bench. Give him the bag. Do not look in the bag. Come back. Done it within two minutes. Mm. He gave me two £20 notes and a £10 note, £50. From that time there, I now had this sense of, not power, but wow, I've just made £50. Mm. I'm calling my friends, oh, I've got £50, come and meet What me. age is that now? This is year seven, year eight. So you had to left him at 11, 12 years old. Pardon? You're talking 11, 12 years old. Yeah, 11, 12 years old, 13, going in that, that, that period of time. But he continued then to ring me continuously for weeks and months. Mm. So now I started to miss secondary school. I'm meeting this individual and I basically got turned into his drug runner. Um, from that point now, came entrenched within a local gang. And then that's when things got very Blade. serious. Certain people, you know, lost their lives. There was bloodshed. My mum is finding out. Um, started smoking a lot of cannabis, mm. which really affected my mental health. And again, the same as London, my mum became very worried about what was going on. Um, and she decided that she wanted to move to Reading. Mm. Now, at that point, due to my mindset, I felt like I can't leave my friends and the situations we're in because mm. I'm kind of running away. And this friendship group that I had, I felt like they was my family. I felt like there's a sense of loyalty. Mm -hmm. um, so my mum moved to Reading and I ended up staying in Sheffield. But bearing in mind, this was like year 11. So we was living in a council house on the same estate I told you about. I'm in this house by myself. Um, that became a spot for the man then to chill. Um, and things, like I said, went left. I'm out all hours. There's no authority around. Mm. Um, so we're talking about 16 now. Yeah, around that, around that era now, 16. Mm. So what's happened from there? Um, my mum's contacted me. So during that time, I didn't go and see her in Reading. It's mad because my mindset was, I can't leave my area for a day and go and visit my mum or go and visit a family member because if something happens locally, people can like, Moses, where are you? What's going on? You can't just up and leave. So, yeah. Was that an unwritten rule, though? That you, it wasn't like something that was said out loud. That was just something you felt. Yes. It wasn't like no one's forcing me to be here. Mm. But due to my mindset, I felt like I have I to be. I can't be here, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, what's happened now? Um, my mom's contacted me and she said, look, Redding's nice. You know, you're still young. You still got your whole life ahead of you. Come down and just check it out. See what you think of it. I've never been there in my life. I thought... Reading was in the middle of Wales, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I've come to Reading. I came out of the train station. Um, first time, automatically is very different to what I perceived it originally. Um, like I said, it's a very multicultural area, mm. almost like a miniature London. And um, the same day I've landed, I'm walking through the town centre and I've noticed police tape around a local nightclub. Loads of police, people standing around. I'm thinking, that's a bit strange. What's going on? So I've asked the police officer what's happened. He explained last night a young man um, had been killed in a local nightclub, been attacked. So in my head, I'm thinking, wow, 
so the same things that's happening in London, Sheffield happening is in. happening in Reading. Um, anyway, like I said, I've moved there to start my life again, not knowing anyone. Um, I enrolled myself into college, um, made new friends, and also got a job. So I was working in Foot Locker. That's kind of where I met a lot of people in the community. Okay. If you imagine, you know, Foot Locker, there's loads of different people coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're creating conversations. They could tell I was from up north because of my accent. So I'm now networking. Um, but by now, though, have you decided to leave the streets or was it just a, just a little phase of yourself just to see how it's going to be in Reading? If I'm honest, it was 50-50. Um, I still had the street mentality in me, but I was fighting that kind of demon where I wanted to do good. I want to go college. I want to get a job. I want to live my life right. But what happened, college went left. Uh, got into a silly little fight in college. Ended up getting kicked out. And then, you know, certain individuals that I had around me in Reading kind of got me back into the roads. So, you know, I've got back into that mindset. Now, going back to when I became Muslim, when I was in Sheffield, I had a very good Pakistani brother. Uh, he's obviously a Muslim. And uh, he used to be in school, trousers rolled up. He's got a miswap. And that intrigued me. He looked so clean, humble. I remember I asked him one time, you know, why have you got this tree in your mouth? <laughs> like, what, what it is, looks like. What is this thing in your mouth? Yeah. And he explains a miswap, this is what it's about, etc. He was giving me dawah. So when I, had, when I came to Reading, I had a, a piece of Islam in my head, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in college, I had a very good friend who continued to give me dawah and they sent me to a shop, an Islamic shop in our local area. I uh, went down to that shop, got some books, spoke to the owner of the shop and he said, look, come to some lectures with me, um, see what you think. So alhamdulillah, attended the lectures for about three months and uh, took my shahada from there. Okay. Um, so these times, yeah, I'm about 18 say 18, 19, but I wasn't practicing. So alhamdulillah, I took my shahada. Um, I was so happy and felt so clean, like literally a weight is off my shoulders. Mm. I remember I left the community center where it happened. It was a Pakistani community center. And um, I'd gone to the local halal like butchers and I wanted the brother to know I was Muslim. I'm like, oh, salam alaykum, Aki. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Salam alaykum, I'm a Muslim. Can I get some chicken? A house chicken? <laughs> Actually, when I look back at it, it was so cringe. No. But I was just wanted to get yeah, that yeah, yeah. handshake. Know. You know, I'm a Muslim, you know? Mm. So anyway... Um, Do you look back now again and ask, like, what was it about Islam, though? Obviously, you said about the brother was clean, mashallah. But when you made it, because it's a big step to make. Yes. Especially if you're a Christian or if, even if you're a Jewish or whatever. Yeah. To, to say, I'm going to follow a particular way of life that's kind of foreign to you, it's a big step. I don't know how it feels like. I can just tell by many people that say you know, how it made them feel. So how did it make you feel? You said kind of how it made you feel, but what made you change? What made you say, you know what, actually this is the right way to live? Was there a specific thing? Mm. Okay, I mean, I would say going back to, like I said, with the Christianity side of things, asking my mother certain questions regarding, you know, Jesus and what are the beliefs and the Holy Trinity. I'm just not getting the answers. The answers. It's not giving me that fulfilling, fulfill, fulfilling uh, feeling mm. of completion. Mm. When I'm looking to Islam, there's nothing that turned me away or I couldn't see as, okay, this doesn't really make sense. Or if I'm asking brothers or the imam questions, everything is making sense. Yeah. Complete sense. So in terms of me making a decision, it was, it was clear cut. The problem that I had really was my mother because mm. she's a strong, born and bred Jamaican Christian. For her, Islam is Pakistan, Asian. You're turning Pakistani. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you've been brought up as a Jamaican. This is our heritage. What do you mean? It's like you're leaving your heritage kind of thing. Yes. And I believe around those times we had the terrorism attacks mm -hmm. going on. So she was very skeptical. Um, but alhamdulillah, that's, she could see the blessings behind it now and the changes I've made for the better. So, yeah, become Muslim. Um, how has it been Muslim then? Like who taught you about prayers and all that kind of stuff at that age? 
Okay, so again, I was going to local masjid, um, attending the rules. I was around, alhamdulillah, good brothers. Alhamdulillah, Muslim community in Reading is, is vast. It's grown over the years. Mm. Um, going to lectures in Birmingham, etc., London. So I got myself in a better mindset, um, managed to get off the roads. Okay. And then uh, I started... When you say managed to get off the roads, though, again, what, what kind of mindset shifts happened to make that? Good question. So... Like I said, I got back on the roads once I got kicked out of college. Mm -hmm. When I was now on the roads, I was, without going into too much detail, delivering a substance that I'd never worked with before. Mm. This substance was giving me a reality check on life. So I'm giving this substance to certain people and I just knew this is wrong. You know, like the 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 the, the way the people was interacting with the substance. Yeah, with the substance, how they, you know, acting with me. Um, you know, there's so many paths of a drug user, a heavy drug user. And when you sit down and you talk to them, I told this to young people all the time. When you sit with a drug user mm -hmm. and you ask them, you know, what's been your journey through life? How did you get up on this drug? It's generally through some type of trauma. Mm. They've lost a, a family member, these types of things. So, yeah, that kind of put a real negative on it. I still carried on for a period of time. Mm. Um, and alhamdulillah, yeah, when I managed to get work, and again, uh, being around the right companions, mm. that kind of outweighed it. So you shifted to uh, more, like, different friends? Yeah, I had to. Mm. I had to be around the right companions. Um, alhamdulillah, I went for Umrah. Um, this was some, with some brothers from Reading. Mm. And then when we went for Umrah, they explained to the brothers, you know, there's an Islamic university in Medina. Um, we went there to visit and um, we all ended up applying. Right there and then. Right there and then. So one of the brothers that we had with us who lived over there, he knew the right guy to speak to and, you know, how Saudi works, fast forward this, this, this. So I've applied and um, yeah, I've come back to the UK. About two years later, the imam from the mosque in Reading has called me. He's like, Musa, you've been accepted into Medina Islamic University. I was like, what are you on about? <laughs> I don't know. What <laughs> I was confused because I, I didn't even remember, you know. Mm -hmm. And he's like, your name is on the website. They released a list of names. Mm -hmm. And he sent me, I was like, okay, subhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very difficult place to get into. I was yeah, saying I to you before the video, like a lot of people apply years after years after years and Qadr Allah, some get in and a lot don't get in. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, so Alhamdulillah, I've got in, I've spoken to my family, I've spoken to brothers to try and understand it a bit more because I'm still a new Muslim. Mm. My, my, my knowledge is very weak. I don't know any Arabic. You know, I've never lived in a country like Saudi before. Mm. Alhamdulillah, Took it upon myself to to go. What age was you now then? Because you said 18 Muslims, so you were about 20, 21? Around 21, 22, I believe. Mm. Yeah, early 20s, let's say. Um, now, when I've got there, uh, I knew a brother from Reddin, Abdul Rahman, who was over in Mecca. So I had a point of contact. Um, also, the brothers in Reddin, they knew brothers over in Medina to interact with and show me around. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've arrived and I was living on the campus itself, which was a very different environment that I'd never been into before. Um, I was sharing a room with a brother from Togo. Togo, uh, that's that place in Africa? West Africa. Yes, West Africa. Uh, brother Bashir, mashallah. Um, he'd been in Saudi for a number of years, but he only could speak French, Arabic, and his own language, no English. Okay. Um, so this alhamdulillah made me have to kind of pick things up much faster. Mm. Um, you know, even just being in the Mahad, that my teacher was from Egypt, no English. Mm. Um, you know, if you want to go get a taxi and these things, you have to force yourself to kind of Arabic, yeah. to speak Arabic. So alhamdulillah, I stayed there for around two years. So I didn't complete the Jamia, didn't even complete the Mahad. What happened, it was the same time as the war with Yemen and the Houthis. Okay. Uh, what was that now? What year was this then? Oh, you're asking a question. Yemen and the Houthis. 2000 
You know the politics in my man. Come on, man. It's 17, isn't it? When, it when, be just before. Just before. It might have been fresh, but that was very active. Um, so you was in the Jamaica for two years? Yeah, but obviously it was gaps. So I was coming back to England. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it was around about two years from between England and Saudi, basically. Mm. Um, yeah, so that was happened. I've come back to the UK for a temporary stay for a holiday, sort my family out and stuff. And uh, the King of Saudi passed away. Um, now, at that point, new rulings came in um, for the students. Um, obviously, I had Nikama, so the residential stay and stuff, a student one. And um, I had to go to the Saudi Bureau in London to go back to sort stuff out. And they mentioned about my criminal record. So when I originally applied and went through the process, they do the normal checks. It was no problem. Um, when they were now checking it over again, I said, ah, oh, this is a problem. We might not be able to go back, try to explain myself. Not just me, other students, in particular students from the West mm. that were having this, this issue. Um, but they wouldn't understand the fact that you wasn't a Muslim. I tried to explain, obviously, Jahili, et cetera. But they was like, okay, this is a new rule. You're going to have to stay. Allah is what it is. So, yeah, ended up coming back to the UK, um, staying here. At this point, I was living in Edmonton um, and things went a bit left family-wise. Um, I ended up splitting up with someone, um, kind of affected my mental health and I had to end up moving back to Reading. I also just want to take you back to... Medina, you know, so in terms of your study, you said about two years. Um, what did you get from the studies there? You mentioned Arabic and you were forced to kind of like learn it more in terms of Iman wise, mm. more in terms mm. of spirituality. Mm. They really remember it's you got Medina, the university, but then you got the city as well. Of course. And then you got these teachers which teach in the Prophet's, mm. um, you know, the university, but in the Prophet's masjid. Yes. You know, did you get a chance to study with them? You know, so what was the, the environment? What did you get? Did you also meet Ismail Buman, rahimahullah? You remember Sheikh Ismail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was around that time as well. He, he was over there as well, alhamdulillah. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so experiences from that, those two years in Medina. Mm. It's a very good question. I mean, especially I would say the mixture of brothers from every country in the world that you see. Obviously, this is something predominant that we know, but when you're in that environment and you're seeing brothers from Indonesia, Africa, Caribbean, all in one environment, learning the deen of Allah. That was something that was really powerful to me. Even at nighttime, we used to play football. There'll be brothers from this country, brothers from this. It's like a mini World Cup in the Jamia. It's crazy stuff, <laughs> crazy stuff. Pete brothers playing basketball. Um, That's the American brothers probably. Yeah. yeah, the American brothers, yeah. But, and obviously going to the Haram. Mm -hmm. um, such a be peaceful, beautiful environment. Everyone, anyone who's been to Medina knows it's very tranquil, mm. you know, compared to Mecca, it's more hustle bustle, but it's very, very peaceful. There's always a debate, you know, between us. <laughs> yeah. You say, what, what's more, what would you rather live in, like Medina or Mecca? What's, anyway, a lot of us say Medina, but, you know, Sheikh mm. says Mecca. Say Mecca. Mashallah. You said Mecca, bro, last time. I never said Mecca. You didn't say Mecca, no? I thought you said Mecca last time, actually. But majority of us choose Medina because he has that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has that tranquil feeling about it, man. I don't, I don't know how to explain. Unless you've been there, it's very difficult to explain to people what, how it feels like. But carry on. So I don't know, Musa, you know, sometimes like because you took Shahada early and then went, I sometimes think wait a, minute, a person needs to be a bit more longer on Dean, appreciate going to Medina yes. and getting the most out of it. Do you think that happened? it happened too sudden? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a very, very good point. Um, there was even a brother who joined the same time as myself from the UK and within two days he had to go home. He could not handle because the lifestyle, you're now looking after yourself, washing your own clothes, you're going to the shop by yourself, even small things like getting a SIM card for your phone, these things you have to sort out. It was hard for some brothers that might have it more easier for them in the UK, let's say. Mm. Um, the weather as well, the food. Oh gosh, you don't want to eat on the Jamia, the canvas. Well, so they, they had cooked food in the Jamia. Yeah, okay. but there was a lot of cats uh, around. <laughs> Do you know what cats? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of cats, alhamdulillah. But I used to eat out a lot. Um, but yeah. 
Did you meet Ismail, Ismail Buman? Did you meet, meet him there? I didn't meet him personally. Um, I did see him uh, around, but I didn't meet him personally. Did you experience, other than, okay, what you mentioned, it's, it's a different lifestyle. It takes time to get used to, you know, like he mentioned the SIM card. Mm -hmm. Some things are so bureaucratic. Yeah, it just yeah. takes you ages. Yeah, like yeah. you want to change a visa, change a room, go to Mecca for Umrah, it's like four or five signatures, Literally. stamps, Literally. someone just give up. Yeah. But like, put that aside, any negativity, did you feel any negativity from brothers in the Jamia or, you know, the, there was fitness starting, did that have an impact on you? Mm, I would say yes, to an extent. Um, there was certain different not friendship groups, but certain brothers would be like, don't go around these brothers, don't go around these brothers. These types of things that takes you away mm -hmm. from your studies and what you're doing. Uh, try to not get involved with the politics, but these are things that a lot of brothers have gone through over the years that, you know, can really affect you. And also your family, you know, that's probably one of the negatives, I would say. Apart from that, I'm like, I can't... When you say family though, you mean like your family not being there with you? Like that's a separate thing. I mean, like your family getting drawn into the oh, politics. Oh, okay, okay. Because okay. it happens in brothers, it probably happens in sisters. Mm. Um, with your family not being with you, again, that that is hard for some brothers. Mm -hmm. At that time, my family was back in the UK. Um, so you got married, Akhi. You got married before coming to, to Medina mm -hmm. and you left your wife here. Mm -hmm. So that in itself makes it difficult. Yes, very difficult. You know, you always think it, it's like, you know, like you're in prison, my wife's outside and yeah, I'm yeah, inside. Yeah, yeah. That kind of mindset. Very difficult. And, you know, a lot of brothers bring their wives over, yeah. start having a little side job teaching English. So um, this is something that I started to do over there. I had a, a Saudi who I was meeting up and teaching him English to try and make some money. Mm. Um, but yeah. Then return, you've done two years. Mm -hmm. At that stage, were you able to pick up a book in Arabic? And no. No, 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 no. Okay. So like I said, when I left, I barely knew the alphabet. I couldn't read. Okay. So alhamdulillah, now I can read and I know basics. But then it was very, very difficult. Um, and because I'm around, you know, many of the brothers from England, okay. there were various levels. The brothers, you know, who might be better, would you say, with their knowledge and their Arabic, they might be busy doing their own thing. Um, other brothers are trying to learn. We're trying to help each other. Then you don't want to mess up another brother's schedule. You might not want to ask a brother for help, these types of things. So you're trying to do a lot by yourself. Me personally, um, find my own way of learning. So yeah, I've lost a lot of it because of what happened after Medina, where my mindset and where my life went. Um, but yeah, alhamdulillah, it was a beautiful, beautiful, time of my life that I'll never forget. Were you able to do Hajj, Umrah? I haven't done Hajj. Haven't Umrah, you've done Umrah a few times? Yeah, I've done Umrah a few times, yeah, alhamdulillah. It's part of the blessing, Akhi. Yeah, yeah, So moving forward, you said you came back and, and you split up with your missus. Yeah. Obviously, we don't need to get into why and wherever, but yeah. how did that then, you said about your mindset, kind of shifted to a more negative way? How did that happen? So, like I said, I was living in London, Edmonton. Um, I then had to now move or make a decision where I go with my life. Um, obviously, I don't have any family in the UK, going back to my mother and father. All of my mum's side are in Jamaica. All of my father's side are in Germany. So I decided to move back to Reading, but maybe due to my ego and my pride, um, I didn't want to ask brothers or my friends for help. Um, and what help did you need though at that time? Mainly somewhere to stay in financial help. When I was living in London, I was working three halal clean jobs. Now I've got to come back to Reading. Three? Three jobs, Akhi. Three jobs. One was as a steward at uh, football stadiums, like weekends. One was as a delivery driver for a takeaway at nights. And in a day, I was working in a call centre. So I was juggling. Inshallah. Just trying to survive. And this London, London. Oh, you have to, Akhi. But, you know, even though you have to, a lot of people don't actually do that. So yeah. it shows a lot of, mashallah, your, your, your enthusiasm to at least legit and to make money in the right way. A lot of people would have just done their one job and said, you know, I'm going to watch Netflix for the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So yeah. to, 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 to do free jobs, mm -hmm. mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Um, so yeah, my, my, my biggest issue now coming back to Reading is I've got no work. 
mm. and I've got no place to stay. Um, at this point, I made a bad decision. I ended up going back to the roads. To the roads. Um, for a period of time, I was literally living in my car. I didn't want to ask anyone, how can I stay at yours? My mum was in the Caribbean. What, what happened with mum's place? Couldn't you stay at mum's place or...? No, so obviously these times, my mum's living in Reading mm -hmm. by herself, but she was in the Caribbean and I couldn't ring her to say, mum, can I stay at yours? Mm. Um, did your relationship with mum break down because of you being a Muslim? Did it break down? Yeah. I wouldn't say it broke down. Um, no, nah, I wouldn't say it broke down. You, you still kept it good? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and also, sorry, it's just going back a bit, siblings. Any siblings or you're the only child? I'm the only child. Okay. But we're going to get into that a bit later. Um, so, yeah. So, so were you not ringing her? Was that, would you say that's the ego side of you? What, for help? Yeah, not asking your mum, oh, mum, give me the key, let me stay at your house, kind of thing. Or yeah. was it what? I think it was the ego pride in the sense of like, as a man, mm. I didn't want to go to my mum and ask for help. I should be helping you. I didn't want to come across as a burden to my mother, to my friends, to anyone but myself. So, yeah, I've made this decision. Um, That's a good quality, Akhi. It's a good quality. And a lot of that is also coming from your mum. You know, your mum, for example, move, moving from born in Lucian, Sheffield, moving from Sheffield to Reading. You know, that also credit to her. Uh, even when you said, look, about the drugs, you know what? When I was kind of like, selling, shotting drugs. There was a conscious side that this because you're seeing the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of that cultivation, tarbiyah of the mum, she coming from a Christian religious background. You know, all of that is part of the qadr for where you are today. Mm. But yeah, credit to your mum as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. So yeah, got back on, on, on into that mindset, into that life. Um, but now I'm also steering towards back working. So I'm juggling a bit of both. Um, I'm around certain brothers again and um, they're basically asking in regards to my family you know my father's situation mother's situation these questions these, these, these types of things they've given me the knowledge that obviously you know parents have rights over you um, so the place where I was working was a bailiff company and um, one day I was at work I was thinking to myself let me try and see if I can find my dad. Bearing in mind, I haven't had any contact with him at all, probably from the age of nine, 10. So many years, couldn't even remember what he looked like, if I'm honest. So I've gone to my friend, who's part of the tracing team for this company, said, look, I'm going to give you this name, pull it in the system, see what comes up. Any name, any details, it will come up with the depot system, etc. So I've given him my father's name. He's come back to me a couple of hours later. He said, I've got three names that I'm kind of matching with the same last name. One of these names was Mohammed Heidenbluth. So my last name is Heidenbluth. Very strong German name, distinctive, right? I'm thinking, who's that? I've never heard of a Mohammed Heidenbluth. So what's happened now? He's got an address for this individual. I thought to myself, let me write this guy a letter. I've written a letter saying, look, my name is Moses Heidenbluth. That's my name. Um, I'm trying to find my father, Michael Heidenbluth. You've got the same last name. If you know him, can you please contact me? Okay, within about two weeks, I'm at work. My phone's ringing. I didn't answer it. It's lunchtime. I had a voicemail. Hi, I've got your letter. I've got information. Please call me. I'm thinking, okay. I've called this guy. He's like, yeah, hi. That's yeah. the Muhammad Hayden. Muhammad. I can't say the surname, sorry. <laughs> Hayden Bluth. Hayden Bluth, Aki, yeah? Okay. Alhamdulillah. So um, I'm like, yeah, um, hi, I'm trying to find my father. Do you know him? He's like, yeah, I know him very well. I was like, okay, Alhamdulillah, give me some information. He's like, you're talking to him. I said, huh? No, 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 brother, you're not understanding. My father is Michael, right? You're Muhammad. He's like, yeah. Okay, I hang up the phone. Mm -hmm. I hang up the phone. I'm about to call some brothers. I said, bro, I just spoke to this guy. He's saying his name is Michael, but Muhammad. He's like, you know what that means? He became Muslim. Your name's Moses, you're Musa. 
yeah. must be Muslim. Mm. I said, no way. Mm. Okay, he was Jewish, mm. alcoholic. You understand? I couldn't fathom this. That is crazy. Uh, when you said Michael and Muhammad, I kind of, my brain did kind of think, makes sense. But that's a big jump at the same time. I thought he was going to say, be a like, Jewish son. I thought he was going to say, I'm his son. I'm your oh. brother. <laughs> so I was thinking. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I've hung up the phone, okay. And then I've, I've had to get my, my, my mental state back to normal. Calm down. I've called this guy back, alhamdulillah, and um, said, look, my name is Moses. Do you know who I am? He's like, obviously, you're my son. I said, look, I don't know. You probably don't know, but my name is Musa. He's like, you're Muslim? I was like, yeah. He said, I'm Muslim. I was like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> We're getting somewhere. Okay, wallahi, I thought I was dreaming. Mm. I did not know where my head was at. Mm. This was all a dream. Yeah, that's crazy. But it was more happiness, would you say? Of course, I came yeah, yeah. I found my father and he is a Muslim. Mm. I'm thinking, this is like a movie. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So, um, was he in Reading as well or was he in London? So he was in Collindale in North London. Colin Dow, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he explained to me on the phone, he'd been Muslim for around eight years. So he was actually Muslim longer than me. And he explained to me what happened after he broke up with my mother, he moved to Israel. Okay. He moved to Israel. He said when he was in Israel and kind of studying Judaism, mixing with the locals, due to the conflict that was happening with Palestine, he questioned it. He was questioning the locals and he said they kind of turned against him. It said to him, you're not even Jewish. You're not even Jewish. Mm. So from that point, he's come back to England. My father is an older generation, 70s, retired. So when he was in London, he had the lifestyle of going to local coffee shops, you know, like chilling with the Afghanis and the Moroccans, drinking tea all day. Mm. That was him. Mm. So he became in, 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 engraved in that. And um, he was around these brothers. They was giving him dawah. And um, he explained, he then took another venture to Morocco. Now, when he's gone to Morocco, he said that's kind of when he really saw the different attributes of Islam, hearing the adhan, the call for prayer, mm -hmm. seeing how the Muslims operate. He then returned to the UK around the same brothers in the coffee shops. They took him to a local masjid and alhamdulillah, he took shahada from there. After that, alhamdulillah, he went back to Morocco and got married. Okay, um, so okay, again, this is all a dream. Okay, I was just like, okay, he's telling you all of this in one go, all of this in one go. I'm relaying it back to brothers. They're like, okay, this is amazing. I had a local radio station in Reading contact me, got me on their radio station. I'm telling them this amazing story, alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I went to meet him. Now, I went to meet him by myself, went to Collindale, and I remember he was living in a flat. I've knocked on his door. Now, bearing in mind, Akhi, I did not know or could remember what he looked like. Okay. I remember my father to be very tall, blonde hair, blue eyes. He's come to the door. He's much shorter than myself. Big beard. I was like, subhanAllah, this is beautiful, Akhi. Look at this guy. How This is my father. Mm. Took me into his house. We're conversating. Emotions are running. We're catching up. He then says to me, Today, I've got to interview uh, a carer that's going to be looking after me. Do you mind? I said, don't worry, I'm with you all day. I'll come with you. So we've then ended up getting a taxi. And um, when we got in a taxi, I noticed that my father and the taxi driver were talking very close, like they knew each other. Mm -hmm. We've now pulled up on a high street somewhere in North London. And my father's jumped out. He's like, I need to go cash praying. So, like, okay, go cash praying. I'm sitting talking to the brother. I was like, oh, you know my dad? He's like, yeah, I've known him for years. It's like, oh, I'm his son. I've met him for the first time. It's like, you're his son? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, okay. Now, I'm waiting in the car. I'm thinking, where's my dad gone? Now, when I spoke to him on the phone originally and I was catching up with him, he mentioned regarding the alcohol situation, he no longer drinks. He stopped drinking, alhamdulillah. This is what I was told. I've then noticed him leave the cash point and go inside a pub, which is next door to the cash point. I'm not thinking, what's he doing? Where's he going? Obviously, we're going to interview this carer. 
I've got, uh, sorry, no, I haven't got out. I said to the taxi driver, brother, please do me a favor, just tell me the truth. Do you take him here all the time? I just need a drink, sorry. <laughs> what are you saying he went to the pub? To Aki. drink? Aki. That's different. Aki. He's gone in the pub. Daytime. Sorry, sorry. Let me go back to the taxi driver. I said to the taxi driver, do you take him here all the time? He goes, brother, I don't want to get involved. Please. I, don't, I can't answer these questions. I said, brother, please, brother. Brother to brother. I need to know. He said to me, I take him all the time. My dream dropped. But I put on a persona of I'm still, I don't know what I was. I was still happy. I'm going to ride the wave. So I've got out the car. I've gone into this pub. Okay, I remember I was wearing my kufi. I was, you know. Muslimed I, out. Muslimed out, Akhi. <laughs> I'm walking in this pub. I'm thinking, this is odd settings for two Muslim love. That's big beard. I'm there, kufi. Like, <laughs> Akhi, we've, we've sat down now. We've sat down. And um, the landlady woman's come over. Yeah. And she's talking to my dad on like first name terms. I'm thinking, huh? What, Muhammad or Michael? I it's Michael. Okay. It was Michael. <laughs> that's, a, that's a clarify that because... Nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now. It was a Michael vibe. Okay. So I'm thinking in my head, wow, how do these two know each other? This is odd. Um, now she's come over and she's returned with a pint of alcohol. Mm. Slapped it in the middle of us. I'm looking at him, looking at the drink. He's picked it up. Stuff with like, he started sipping it. That point, I don't know what, what I felt, if I'm very honest with you. I said to him, what are you doing? This is haram. You, why are you drinking? You said to me you don't drink. Akhi, astaghfirullah, he then said to me, allegedly, he went to his local mosque, spoke to the imam, and told the imam, you look like you know he's going to... He knows I'm about to look left. That's why he knows. He knows. <laughs> he's gone to the imams. <laughs> And um, he said, look, I'm meeting my, my son for the first time. I'm very nervous. I think he said to me, the imam allegedly told him, go and have a drink. <laughs> Astaghfirullah. <laughs> Wallahi, at that time, I really felt destroyed because I knew he's lying, Aki. Mm. No imam. He's trying to justify it. He's trying to justify and make mm. excuses, Aki. Mm. This is the first time I'm meeting you in years. And Wallahi, if he said to me, I'm going to let you know I still drink. Yeah. I'm Muslim, but I drink. Even if you do drugs, mm. Wallahi, I'd still love you this more. Because you know that's your weakness. Yeah, like, just be truthful. Mm. So even, even at Musa, it's like, one, Muslim struggle. Yeah, as long as we know it's haram and we're asking Allah for help, no. you know, everybody has different struggles. Of course. Even what maybe him drinking and giving you that story, in a way, it's... It's an extra shame that he has. Mm. It's not a negative, Akhi. Okay, He's okay. trying to just look. Mm. All right, I've been drinking, but you know, what do I tell my son? Mm. He's a Muslim. I'm happy. Mm. But this is my struggle. Mm. Okay, a solution is, the Imam told me I can do this because I'm a bit nervous. Mm. It's out of shame, Akhi. It's not, it's not a negative. Okay. okay. Yeah, and, and you've had in history, yeah, people who struggle with different vices mm. and harams, but they had also a good side, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, as Muslims. So, yeah. Yeah, just, you know, reflecting on that. Um, on a side note I don't know because you know you, you, for us here it's about like building bridges Akhi, you know the bridge what we don't want is you having a negative impact with your father because of what you're saying here so you know it's, it's maybe he watches this he might not like it and it's your dad my father passed away so I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna go into Okay, okay. Yeah, so what's happened now? Um, yeah, he's told me the imam's told him this. I'm like, we got to go to the imam right now. Let's get a taxi. I've got to question this imam. He's like, no, don't worry. He's good, brother. So anyway, time's floating by. The woman's come with the re-up. Another one. I'm thinking, this has got him left. I said to him, where's the woman you're, you're interviewing? You said we're coming here to interview the carer. She's cancelled. We've ended up leaving the pub. We've gone to a local restaurant. I'm putting on this persona where I'm, I was happy, alhamdulillah, I was happy. But I'm still... There's a level of disappointment. Distraught inside. I've gone back to his house and um, conversations are flowing. 
um, I've told him, I, at that time I had two children, two daughters, alhamdulillah, and um, he wanted to see them. So we're having conversations. He's like, oh, maybe you could lend me some money so I can come to Reading, thinking in my head, this is a bit much. This is the first time meeting you. Um, certain things. I, I remember I had to leave the house, step out, call one of my boys and say, look, I feel like I might have to leave. Like, what do you recommend I should do? Because my mental health is all over the place. I ended up staying. Anyway, later that night, I've left. I've got on a train back to Reading. I'm honest with you, actually, I cried the whole way. Mm. Like, I was very distraught, emotional, thinking, wow. I, I, I was good. I was happy, but I was upset. And I, I, I didn't really have anyone to talk to. Um... So I've come back to Reading and then he continued to contact me for a few weeks. But what do you reckon he was asking for? Money. 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 And um, for, for the sake of my mental health, I, I couldn't have any more contact with him. Uh, it's but, a struggle that he was going through, Akhi. You know, it's like one of the brothers, I mean, we give different, you know, advice. It was somebody takes your heart. It was a brother took your heart in a masjid a couple of months ago. So a new brother came to him and he said, brother, you know what? At least now you have hope. You, you, you understand? He was a Muslim. Mm -hmm. There's some hope. He's got the shahad. He's got la ilaha muhammad rasulullah. And also it's like sometimes because it's close, mm -hmm. we become extra, what's the word? Judgmental. Mm -hmm. There'll be brothers that come here, take shahad, and they're friends, they're smoking weed. Mm -hmm. We'll give them a little, say, brother, take your time, inshallah. You know, mm -hmm. just strive, try and give it up. Mm -hmm. So I mean, because it's somebody close to you, okay, you took the persona or the, or, or the stance of, you know what? It's just difficult for me to cope with. Mm. Even that's his struggle. Like, and everybody's got a different struggle that they're going through. And we don't know in Allah's eyes who's better. Mm, mm. Him or another person. Mm. There might be somebody who's making salah in a masjid, not doing that, but they're doing it to show off. There's no ikhlas. Sure. Where what he might be doing, the salah and the struggle, and even with the struggle, it might be Ibn Qayyim, you probably heard Ibn Qayyim, he says, look, a person sins and goes to Jannah because of a sin. And a person does a good deed and goes to hellfire. And then he explains the person who sins, actually feels so low and bad. And because of that, ends up in Jannah. The one who does a good deed makes him feel, ah, you know what, I'm special, I'm better than others. That it results in me eventually going into Jahannam. So, you know, it's, yeah, I understand where you're coming from because that's your dad now. Yeah, and then, you seem like a superhero, all of that kind of stuff. You haven't seen it for so many years. You want to just goodness from him. But then obviously that. Yeah, I think it was all the build up. Like I said, I was even on this radio station. I've come back to Reading. Even certain brothers was asking me, oh, how was it? And I was lying to them. I, was, I didn't, I, I felt very embarrassed. I didn't want to say, oh, I went to a pub and he done this, he done that. I was like, oh yeah, alhamdulillah, it went very well, yeah, alhamdulillah. Um, so yeah, I eventually ended up cutting him off, Ahi. Um, I couldn't deal with it anymore until... Do, do, do you think that was the right approach though? When I look back at it now, mm. no. No. Um... I wish I did try. I do have regret in that sense, but Qadr Allah is where it is, Akhi, I mean. Um, fast forward, uh, things took a bit of a detour in life, um, ended going back towards the roads, um, and I ended up getting remanded. Um, that was a real test, wake-up call for myself. Growing up in the environment I did, um, I saw prison as like a normal thing, um, almost glamorized. This, you know what I mean. But was that the first time you went in? Yeah, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. The first time. It's never been. That was the only time uh, I was I was inside. Um, and from when I got, because obviously I was remanded, so I've got arrested the Friday. They kept me in the local station over the weekend. Gone court Monday, thinking I'm gonna come out. It was like, now nah, you're getting remanded. HMP Bullingdon. They put me in the sweat box. Okay, I'm looking out the window and I'm seeing the world go by. These times, alhamdulillah, I've got five kids. Um, Inshallah. Uh, so, alhamdulillah, I had four or five at that time. I can't remember. But anyway, I'm thinking about my kids. Mm. And again, okay, tears. I'm thinking, well, what have I done? How have I ended up sitting with scholars in Medina to now go into prison? What's your, what's your age at that time now? Pardon? What's your age at that time? Late 20s. Late twenties. Only just reflecting on that and your, your your dad. So sometimes you know it's a question I ask. I even ask you on Juma. 
So uh, your stance with dad, because what dad's doing, and then look, the predicament what you've uh, ended up. I'm assuming, okay, I'm assuming something related to drugs and so on. Yes. Yeah. So the, the, the question is, look, we judge, but who is, as a Muslim, worse, the drug dealer or the one who takes the drugs? You, you understand? Mm -hmm. Someone might say, they look down on someone who's taking it mm -hmm. and drinking, but reflect on it. Mm -hmm. One person is harming himself or herself. Another one's harming families, mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. you know, and he or she has accountability for all of those that he has. You see the point I'm trying to make? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's why it's good not to maybe judge and look down and give a person an opportunity to come back to Allah Ta'ala. Very true. Because even the Prophet Sam, look, I mean, is in Mecca, it's, it's, it's pagans, mushriks. But you don't find the Messenger of Allah saying, mushrik kafir, mushrik kafir. No, no. Okay, he just, you know what? Come, come, come. And companions also had shortcomings. Mm -hmm. But look the, what he done with them and what they became from where they were coming from. And they became the best generation that changed the globe and changed the world. You know, what, what's your take on that? In, in what sense? In the sense time, when, probably. Yeah, in that time with the dad situation and you know what, what you gone back in, to, to prison for. Do you think the stance towards dad being kind of like too harsh? At that time, if I'm honest now, my mindset was just literally all over the place. And I wasn't entrenched at that time. It was literally got caught in the wrong place at the wrong time uh, okay. kind of situation. Um, but yeah, like I said, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going to prison now. Um, and I remember I arrived, they put me on this introductory wing and uh, I woke up the first night and I'm, I literally remember waking up looking for my phone because I forgot I was in prison. Someone's banging at my cell, asking me, oh, where am I from? What have I got for them? I was clueless. Like, when he said to me, what have you got for me? I didn't understand it at the time. It was only when someone explained to me, they thought you might have come in with a phone or drugs. So they're trying to test you out. Um, so this is the first time you've actually been to prison? Mm -hmm. The yeah. first time. So like a new environment. Um, and yeah, I ended up going through that process. And it kind of woke me up in a sense of like, like I said, how have I ended up going on this journey, coming from, you know, being around the right people, right environment to where I am now. Um, and also being in prison and seeing other prisoners from similar backgrounds to myself, uh, a lot of young people, even older people, um, you see prisoners like a business. It's a revolving door. Um, they say it's meant to be like a rehabilitation process, but you eventually see it's, it's not really that. It's not really that. Um, so I kind of formed a plan while I was in there. Um, I didn't get involved with any type of madness or typical type of vibe. Um, I was around the brothers, the right people. Alhamdulillah, one brother even took Shahada with me. I've never had someone take Shahada with me, but the brothers said, yeah, we feel like you can explain it. So Alhamdulillah, that was a blessing, I would say, of being Allah. in there. But yeah, while I was in there, I had a plan that when I come back, I want to give back to my community. Going back to the whole selling drugs in the community and what it does, I had a lot of remorse. I felt like I needed to fix this somehow and make a change. Um, one of my passions in life is football. So um, I decided when I come out, I want to make a football club. But I'm not really from a footballing background. I've never played like for academy or that type of thing. So what's happened? I've come out, I'm going to probation and my probation officer, I'm saying to her, look, well, she said to me, what do you want to do career-wise? I said, I want to work with young people. That was my main thing. She said, you can't work with young people. Your record is X, Y, and Z. I said, no, but I can. I know I can. I think I'm the right person to do this. Again, it's a business. They wanted me to do some construction course. I said, no, nah, I ain't got time for that. I didn't want to get back on the roads. So I started a job as a bin man. Wallahi, I love that job. I looked down on it back in the day. So I've been, man, like, mm. that's never me. Mm. But I love that job. I could getting up in the morning, you know. Early morning. Early morning, you know, keeping fit, dashing rubbish. And then you finish mid-afternoon, like, you've got whole time to 
free. Mm. Yeah, but it's, it's, I, I would say though, as a and I, I'm a person, I always push for people, business, whether you're working for yourself or whatever, but to bring yourself down from that mindset of the roads and to say, I'm going to be a bin man takes a lot. Because most people would never, <laughs> yeah, yeah, never yeah, yeah, catch yeah. them. It, they can be practicing there, but they will never touch. So okay. that ego is still there. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. to put yourself at that level, it takes a lot, man. A lot of people were surprised yeah. when they saw me running around in this fluorescent <laughs> outfit behind a bin truck. But yeah. I'm the lucky, you know. I you humbled yourself inside. I had to humble myself. And mm. because of my children as well, my family, you know, I need to set in a good example. Mm. And I, I had a plan, like I said, of what I wanted to achieve when I come out. This was the start. So while I was doing that, I started my football club in 2020. And um, it's called Give Back FC. So it's all about getting involved within the community, other charities, giving back in the community through various means, do uh, work with helping the homeless, young people, etc. Um, when I started, it was just one men's team, but I had an Instagram page, social media. It's getting very well known in Reading. I randomly got contacted by, uh, do you know Yoss? Yacht? Yeah, you defending team? So a random yacht worker's called me. I've never met this person in my life. And um, she said, I've heard about you in the community and what you're doing with your football club. Have you ever thought about working with young people? I said, look, I would love to do this. Probation is saying to me, I can't. She's like, okay, don't worry about that. I might be able to help. She's then mentioned a charity in London called St. Giles's Trust. Mm. Um, I knew about them through probation and the prison system because they work in there, but I didn't know the full ins and outs. So she basically said they hire people with lived experience. You know, you, know, uh, you can work with young people, mentoring, et cetera. I was like, okay, cool. This sounds intriguing. Okay. She sent me an application, alhamdulillah, filled it out, and they contacted me for an interview. This was a surprise itself. I'm, I'm juggling probation. Mm. I'm working as a bin man. Um, had the interview. Alhamdulillah, they offered me the job. Okay, that was life changing. I appreciate them so much for seeing, in, not, how can I say this? Potential, maybe? The potential, that's the word, Aki, the potential, and giving me an opportunity to do what I really want to do. Um, so yeah, alhamdulillah, I was working with St. Giles. I was now going into schools all around the UK. So I was doing assemblies on knife crime, county lines, uh, all of these lived experiences. And I was juggling the football club in Reading. So You stopped the bin man job. Yeah. So as soon as I got my job at St. Giles, mm. see you later, bin job. Um, started doing that. No. Khatab's at there, isn't it? Khatab's with St. Khatab's at St. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know Khatab. I've, oh, yeah? I've been with his workshop, so yeah. yeah, yeah Masha, yeah. very good brother. Articulate, Masha. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I was doing that. Juggling, juggling uh, the football club. Now, going back to my father. One day I was on my, work, oh, on my way to work at St. Giles. I've got a call from my mother. Very early in the morning. Very unusual time. She's like, Moses, I need to talk to you. You need to sit down. I was like, mum, I'm on the high street going for a train. She's like, sit down. At that point, I knew it was bad news. But I'm thinking it's to do with my family in Jamaica, who are the family that I've been brought up with. I've sat down. She's like, look, I think your father might be dead. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, my mum's very old school and doesn't understand certain things. So she's tried to show my family in Jamaica what I do with give back in the community, she's gone on Google and just typed my name in thinking everything's going to come up. But it doesn't work like that. <laughs> so when she's done that, it's come up with a link which is uh, brought up a death certificate for my father. Michael. Yeah. So she said, I've got this. She sent it over to me. Again, my mind just went like, I didn't know how to take it. Obviously, I'm distraught. I'm thinking, should I have maintained contact with him? If I had to kind of bring myself back down, spoke to my wife, alhamdulillah, had some brothers advising me. I've contacted the, web, the website and they've connected to me like these people that deal with wills and all these things. So they've then gone on to advise me that, do you have any other siblings? I said, no. 
Not that you know of. Not that I know of. They said, okay, well, according to our system, your father was married five times. Inshallah. But my mother always believed she was the only woman married to him. She didn't know about his previous mm. life. Um, they also mentioned he's got a number of siblings. So my wife then got involved. Um, we had some information. These siblings were based up in Stockport near Manchester. Um, anyway, cut it short. She's managed to get hold of two of these siblings, two older brothers. Um, I've spoken to their mother, who was obviously with my father, to understand the story of how you met and what happened. Similar thing. She was with him. He was an alcoholic. He disappeared. Um, and then what I later realized, there's another sibling, a sister who I had from Lewisham. So I got her information, called her, spoke to her mother. Okay, stuff for Allah. Now let me take it back. What's happened? Going back to give back, I'm on LinkedIn, right? Someone randomly has contacted me on LinkedIn, a gentleman. He's like, uh, I need to speak to you. I've been doing some research into my wife's family tree. Can I have your number? Giving it to him. I'm thinking at that point, this is going to be something related to my father's death because it was about six months after that time. Does that make sense? Mm. <clears throat> I've contacted him. He said, yeah, so my wife's family tree, you and her have the same last name. I think you are brother and sister. I said, okay, but do you know our father, my father is, is dead? He's like, no, we didn't know this. I was like, yeah, unfortunately, I found out six months ago, you know, uh, he passed away. Um, again, to rewind, the death certificate. Now, bearing in mind, I found this out in 2022. So quite recent. The death certificate said he died in 2018. 18. So he'd been dead for four years, but I never knew. When was the last time you met him? What year was that? So you said that you had two kids at that time when you met him. Maybe 16 or so, 2016. Yeah, around that time, not too far off, but... Yeah, he died in 2018. Um, but did you confirm that he actually died? Like, was there yeah, like... So, so the, the death certificate had some information that was linked to uh, a hospice. So he, he died of cancer. And he was staying at a hospice in Camden. Um, for me, it was essential that I knew how he was buried, you know, what was his request, you know, etc. It said to me, Alhamdulillah, he requested a Muslim burial. Uh, Alhamdulillah, he's buried in uh, Ilford, Ilford Cemetery. Cemetery. Yeah. That's what Garden, to be, Garden of Peace Cemetery. Yeah. Yes, now, Garden of Peace. Um, Alhamdulillah, he died with the name Muhammad Ibrahim Blue. So, Alhamdulillah, you know, I can tell from that his faith and his belief was very strong to him from that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, going back to the LinkedIn situation. And a sister. Yeah, the sister. Um, so yeah, I've explained to the gentleman, look, father's passed away. Um, this sister is born in Lewisham Hospital. I was born in Lewisham Hospital. She was born directly one year before myself. Now, I've had to relay all of this information to my mother. Mm. That was a very deep, conversation for someone to have with their mother bearing in mind she believed that she was the only woman you know with this man um so i had to tell her look he was with so and so i've got siblings it was on the phone so i don't even know how she took it deep down mm -hmm. you know you talk to someone on the phone and face to face it's different different interaction um so yeah, that was a very hard conversation to have. So altogether, how many siblings do you have? Do you know now? I've counted between five to six because... Different mums, all of them. Yeah. So, so, so the two brothers in Stockport, their mother said when she met him, he had a child in Germany. He, like I said, he was married in Morocco. I don't even know, Achie, if his wife knows he's dead. The maybe, Morocco one. Maybe siblings in Morocco. You know. Maybe siblings in Morocco. Yeah, yeah. I don't know because I have no way of contacting her. I saw her picture, but I have no contact information. 
Um, so yeah, but I haven't taken it upon myself to have a relationship with my sister as yet. Mm. She's very keen to. The two brothers, the English guys, the older guys, they don't want to have. They don't want to know you. They're typical, they're English. I don't know why, but it is what it is. What about the one in uh, Elusium? Very keen. She's keen, but you're not keen. Mentally, I need to just take things one step at a time. But I will. Inshallah. Inshallah I will. Because yeah. you got, uh, you know, the Council of Silatul Rahim, ties of kinship. No. And remember, these are your siblings. They're not at fault for what happened. Of let's course. say by, by, by dad and stuff and you got blood ties like, remember even marriage and Islamically it's important to know I don't know it was a case something you know what some guy slept with someone and later on this guy was with a woman and they realized it's one of his kids yeah seriously you know so keep those ties to know well you know yes. what these yeah. are my relatives her kids are going to be Cousins to your kids and yeah, so on. So. It's this, yeah. It's, yeah. it's very true. Yeah. But yeah, inshallah, I'll definitely uh, look to build that relationship because she is keen. So her mother actually explained to me that he was alcoholic and he was in hospital. And um, she she said to him, look, if you don't change your lifestyle, I will I will leave. And then that's when he's met my mother. So my, my mum and dad, my mum came here from Jamaica. He's come from Germany. They've met in King's College in London. That's where they first, and then alhamdulillah from there, got married, et cetera, had myself. Mm. So, but these other, did he get married to them or was this side stuff? Do you know what I mean? He was like, married. He married them. The first one, I know he was married to. The, the other one, I'm not too sure. You just didn't tell them, basically. Oh, and it baffled me because I'm saying, so So my mother maintained a relationship with his mother in Germany. She only spoke German. Um, and I appreciate my mom so much for doing that because as a Jamaican woman, I remember she had a little dictionary trying to translate, you know, word conversations for word, word for word on the phone. Mm. And she's not even with this man, but for the sake of my relationship and, you know, mm. maintaining the family ties, she tried to do that. So I was saying to my mom, did you not know or didn't she ever tell you that it's got like another two, three there were other families and kids? I was like, no. Mm. They never Maybe told she them. didn't know though. That's another thing. Yeah, I believe she didn't. Mm. I don't think she had a clue. Because naturally a mother, grandmother will kind of say, look, unless she's in it as well, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I would like to think most grandmothers, if they know their yeah. son is that kind of person, they'll say to them, he, he plays around. Yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah. So he probably didn't say, look, this was happening. Mm. So may Allah forgive him for his sins. The that. sibling in Germany you, that you've got no contact with that sibling? Not as yet, no. Not as yet. Again, that's another. This is why in Islam you must tell them in my minutes. Give this it's time to give a lecture, Sheikh. When you're getting married to four women, you must tell all four of them. You hear that, yeah? You hear that, yeah? Yes, I'm hearing, it, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it, man. Tell your missus. Tell you everyone. Why, why, invite why, everyone. Say that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and delete this at the end. <laughs> but yeah, Honestly, moving forward. Because the name is unique. I yes. think it'd be easy. And a dad seems like, you know what, like he's got his lineage there. He's making sure you've got my surname. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you go to Germany, hide and blues. All right. You probably you know find in Morocco, is. hide and blues. You're going to kind of like yeah. start. Yeah. Mm. Have to do some you find that you've you got a little tribe going on there. Man. Literally. Literally. I think, yeah. man. But, but moving forward. And so that's lately, really. That's what we're talking it's just. Very recent. I think it's yeah. Like, two years ago. Yeah. 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 How's life now then? Obviously, we've gone through... Your, your life so far seems to have a lot of ups and downs and, you know, going back and then forward and mashallah. So now at this age, you do strictly, you know, the youth stuff. You're not on the road, nah. any of that stuff. you got how many kids? Five, mashallah, married. Yeah, what are you doing with yourself now? You do still do the St. Giles? Okay, so um, due to the football club progressing, um, I was getting a lot of contacts from professionals, i.e. Thames Valley Police, councils in my area who wanted to kind of help my journey with give back and give me funding, etc. Okay. Um, so I eventually left St. Giles, um, joined a separate organization that I work with now, um, but continuing with the same type of work. So I mainly work at the moment with young people across Berkshire, um, mainly high risk, 
children that are involved with, you know, getting excluded from school, getting involved with criminal activity. Mm-hmm. Um, and it revolves around mentoring, one-on-one sessions, group sessions, uh, assemblies. Um, but also with my football club, I'm juggling that. So that expanded from one men's team in 2020 to now two men's teams with about 60 men signed on across both teams. Mm-hmm. I've got uh, an under 16s team and under 13s team. So on our books, I've got about 100 plus players, people within the, cl- the club associated, staff, mm-hmm. players, uh, volunteers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I get a lot of contact from people in the community, parents who, you know, can you speak to my son and these types of things. So I'm very busy mm. in that sense, but I'm busy for the right reasons, inshallah, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. And these are all, they all play what, Sunday leagues and all Sun, So Sunday league football, mm. um, train on Wednesdays, games on Sundays. Um, but like I said, it's a charity club. So I get them involved with various other projects in the community. Um, I've had my kids go out and clean up the area, help the homeless, um, just trying to teach them basic morals and understandings of life and your community. Because, you know, a lot of these young people, including myself, going back to the drugs game is destroying communities. Mm -hmm. You're destroying your own environment. Mm -hmm. I would say for myself, when I had my children, that's when it really, really hit me that I need to build an environment that is good for them. That makes sense? I really wanted to, them to be comfortable and um, show young people, you know, there's other ways to life than the roads, mm. you know? There's so much opportunities, especially in 2024, um, many opportunities for young people to progress and make the right decisions. Mm-hmm. So you're still living in Reading now? Yeah, alhamdulillah. Reading's my place, man. I love Reading. Convert to London, man. Okay, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> Come back to Berkeley. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> You know what, Reading, Alhamdulillah, it's a nice, it's a nice town, mashallah. And the, the Muslim community is vast. Mm. You know, it's it's been growing over the years. Um, a lot of people say to me, because I've moved around so much, like, where do you class as your home? Yeah, I was going to say that. With London, Sheffield, yeah. Reading. But I would probably say Reading. Mm. A lot of the people that I grew up with in, in Lewisham, in Brooklyn, I have no contact with. Mm. Maybe the odd couple people. Sheffield. I caught for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, Redden is my is my home. And where's your mum now? Uh she's in Redden, um, traveling back and forth to the Caribbean, but she's also in Redden, have mm-hmm. Cool. So as a final wrap-up, obviously we just like to give a final reminder because there's many most of our viewers are like young men, majority of them. Some reverts, some obviously Muslim. Due to your experience, and obviously you've gone, you've touched on a few things. But what would probably be the key thing that's, you know, made you do what you're doing now, really? Because you don't have to be doing give back or anything like that. You can make your money and just live your life. But you've chosen a particular path that, like you just said, it gives back. So the decision to make that firstly, and then secondly, what is it that you're going to do maybe in the future as well that's going to benefit the the, the community? Okay, so in terms of advice for myself, mainly especially you know is is for the young people listen to your elders mm. listen I, if i had listened to my mother it's the same cliche thing but if i'd listened to my mother and the elders that really had my back and you know wanted good for me i would have made so many different choices um and understand, obviously, you're upon what your companions are upon. Mm, mm. So make sure, you know, you are around the right people and the right environment. For me, I had two sets of friends in school. I had good friends that were studying, doing the right things. But I also had bad friends that were doing the other stuff. And I went down the wrong path. When I look at life now, these individuals who went down the right path are doing their own businesses. They have a clean, peaceful life. So it all makes sense. Mm. Um, and also understand your purpose of life. Why are we here? What is our purpose? You know, don't just f- follow the crowd. Follow the trend. You know, we are all separate individuals mm. with our own trials, our own ambitions. Um, so it's, it's about understanding yourself as an individual, 
and not trying to put on any type of portrayal or persona. Persona, sorry. Mm. Um, One thing I'd add to that, yeah, you know what? So those brothers that you mentioned, peaceful life, running their businesses, they haven't got the ability and the skills and experience to do what you're doing today to give it back to the community. So what you went through, there was a you know qadr involved. Allah, Allah Taala's decree and qadr for you to now appreciate what I need to be doing for the youngsters. It's like, you know, Amr bin As, Amr bin As took Islam to Egypt. But they used to say, look, before Islam, he was like an ambassador for the Quraysh. Go to Yemen, go to Egypt, travel. So when the time came, he became a Muslim. He knew now how to maneuver, take part in battles because he knew the area and so on. You know, Allah was preparing him for that later on. So same with you from Sheffield, you know, to Reading, to Medina, coming back, St. Giles, and now all of that, you know, uh, that was part of Allah's plan, inshallah. Yeah, there's lessons in all of it, basically. And uh, was it Umar that said, like, sometimes, the, the, maybe even someone else, but sometimes the worst of people can become the best of people. Well, those, Umar, those who don't know Jahiliyyah mm. don't really appreciate Islam. Mm. But those who know Jahiliyyah then appreciate, look, what the deen's given. Mm. You know, so it's, yeah, it's a better person. So sometimes, we, the, the negatives, even though they are negative, no one can run away from that. I myself went to prison, I myself was on the streets, all of that stuff. But it also makes you who you are today, though. Wow. The street skills that you have, the awareness to know how to move on the streets. And mm -hmm. when you know someone's lying to you, there's certain things you learn on the streets that a person who's never touched the streets will never understand. True, true. Not that you, you promote that life now, but that's the life we've lived. Mm -hmm. So you take that aspect of it and you transfer it into what you've transferred it into now you can articulate yourself like you have mashallah here the kids can resonate with you those who are trying to hit the streets mm -hmm. whereas another person who's been part of the pen and book can't stand on them and be like no. so make sure you don't go to the streets like <laughs> yeah. i ain't listening to you because no. you don't know what you're saying no. so i think yes even though it's negative akhi, alhamdulillah you've turned it into a positive we appreciate you coming barakallah i think the last one i did ask you was just futuristic likewise where is it going yeah so um can't go into too much detail right now, but um, Look, something cooking. something is coming. A, a project is coming, inshallah. Inshallah, may Allah bless it. I mean, we'll hopefully, you know, for the young people, but also to create jobs and opportunities within the community. Um, so yeah, there's something cooking, inshallah. Ah, it's key. And I always say to the people <sighs> who are doing the youth and all of that stuff, you can't tell someone leave the streets um, unless you have an alternative for that person. No. I can't tell a person, don't drop your gun leave your knife, leave this, mm -hmm. and tomorrow someone stabs him or shoots him. No. You understand? Mm -hmm. I have to understand that person. I have to say, you know what? Leave that, take that gun down, but I'm going to move you to this area. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find you a house. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find you a job. You're going to have to then do the rest for yourself. Like, there has to be... A, oh, yeah, you can't just tell someone, drop that. No, no, do you know no, what I'm trying no. to say to you? Like, yeah. people don't understand what it comes with the streets. Mm -hmm. well, I'm rolling with a knife, not because I want to roll with a knife. Mm -hmm. I'm not rolling with a gun because I want to roll with a gun. There's reasons behind There's that. reasons behind that. It might not be justified in your world because you don't understand what I'm going through, mm -hmm. but come with me with alternatives. And at the same time, for those youngsters on the streets, it's easy to also... Because I've been to other countries where I can see poverty is poverty, no. but they ain't doing no badness. No. So it's definitely a culture as well. Mm -hmm. the, the roadside thing that we have in this Western world mm -hmm. is definitely a culture because other African countries and other wherever countries, they don't have gang members. No. And they're poor than poor. Mm -hmm. So it's a culture that we've created mm -hmm. that has to be un-created you know, or unlearned mm -hmm. in, in some shape or form. So I think creating alternatives, like you just said, Akhi, providing jobs is key. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? 100%. And may Allah bless it. Um, we only stopped just for time reasons, but you know, we, we appreciate you coming. May Allah bless your business. And for those who are watching, I hope you've benefited. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.